Yeah. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I guess we have some people joined on the webinar for this session on the study designs for social accountability. Um, the application of realist evaluation interrupted time series analysis and implementation science. Uh, I hope everyone who is online can hear us as well. And we have a room full of people here uh, to learn about what those study designs are. As I'm also very keen to do that, learn uh, the, the study designs in this case. Um, First of all, let me apologize for some difficulties or challenges that we had uh, in the morning session. There were planned webinar session on the study designs for social accountability, the application of randomized control trials. And I'm sure everyone in the room agrees with me that we had a great session, three great presentations with lots of food for thought during the lunch. So we we are going to have uh, the <laughs> colleagues from WHO had kindly agreed that they're going to do the session sometime very soon online so that everybody across the world can participate and learn from what others are doing in the space. So uh, without um, much of a further ado, um, let me uh, introduce the session by saying that we, we learned a lot around the application of the randomized control trials for measuring the social accountability projects, uh, specifically in the areas of RMNCH. And uh, now in this session, we are going to learn about the application of beyond RCTs. I, I think although I'm a statistician and I really love to have cleaner data to the RCT to deal with, analysis and for um, you know, really measuring the outcomes. But at the same time, I'm a great fan of these beyond RCT type of designs. The reason being that it captures much more than what we hypothesize or what we intend to achieve as an outcome because we are living in a complex world and all social interventions have to be embedded within the complex settings. So may I now first invite our speaker is a professorial research fellow at the Charles Darwin University, where she leads and conducts realistic research and evaluation projects. As a, she's, she's one of the uh, realist evaluation methodologists, and um, we're great to have you, Jill. So over to you for the presentation. Thank you very much. It's absolutely fabulous to be here. Um, I've had more fun this morning than I've had at a conference or a workshop for many a long year. So thank you everybody here uh, for what's been a fabulous morning. Um, so I'm going to be talking a little bit about, assuming that the slides actually work, I'll be talking about um, realist research and evaluation um, of a citizen voice and action program, um, which is for maternal and child and conducted in three districts in um, Indonesia. I'm not going to talk about the CBA citizen voice and action approach or methodology itself. Uh, what I am going to talk about a little bit is the, um, the use of realist evaluation and how and why. Um, forgive me for all of those, <laughs> all of those of you who this first slide is teaching to suck eggs, but this is about why would you bother to do a realist evaluation in the first place? And so realist evaluation starts from um, some different assumptions than RCTs or many other um, evaluation approaches. We start from the assumption that programs almost always have different effects for different people in different contexts. Or if you turn that around, you can say nothing works for everyone everywhere all the time. Um, the second thing that we assume is that interventions in and of themselves do not directly cause change. Um, if they did, you would get the same outcome every time you did them, but you don't. Um, and so we, as realists have a different construct of how is it actually that interventions contribute to change? And I'll talk about that in the next slide. 
third thing that we assume is that context really does make a difference, um, but it, <laughs> it does so for particular reasons and in particular ways. So I'll talk about that as well. Um, what that means though, is that if we want to be able to improve outcomes, then understanding the net effect of an intervention is not enough. We need to be able to understand how and why and for whom and in what context and for whom not in what context in order to be able to use that information for program improvement. If we want to adapt um, an intervention to new contexts or to scale up or to scale out, we need to understand whether or not the things that make a program work, it's underlying causal mechanisms, which are different from, uh, from mechanisms in the sense of structures that are put into place. Uh, we need to understand whether or not they work at dif in different contexts or whether they work at scale, whether they work at different points of systems. Um, and so for a realist, realist uh, research and evaluation should be aiming to explain how outcomes are achieved and why they vary across time, context and population groups. So it's not enough for a realist to just say that or whether outcomes were achieved. We want to explain how and why. So all of that is grounded in our approach to understanding how programs work. Um, and idea is the idea of program mechanisms. So programs do things and those um, actions provide some kind of resource opportunity or constraint which then affects the reasoning or the choices or the underlying norms or the collective beliefs of people who are affected by that intervention which then changes their decisions or choices which then contributes to changed outcomes. However, as well as those program, uh, as those things that people are doing in the underlying process, realists start from the assumptions that mechanisms only operate if the context is right. And so we've got to think about implementation context because they affect how the program is implemented, which affects what gets provided to people. We need to be thinking about the things that affect the decision making of individuals, things like culture, gender, resources, their personal history, et cetera, et cetera. We need to be thinking about the political and social environments which affect those decisions as well, politics, econo economics, the level of stability, the level of violence. And we also need to be thinking about whether or not the opportunities are and resources are, in, are available for people to enact the decisions um, <laughs> that they make, even if they make the right, the right choice, the choice that the program is trying to uh, support or encourage, can they in fact put it into practice? And it's interactions between these different multiple mechanisms that are being fired by interventions and the complex contexts in which they operate that produce a pattern of outcomes. And it's the pattern of outcomes that we're interested in much more than the net effect. So in CBA, um, uh, this slide is mistitled, I'm not talking about CBA methodology, I'm talking about this realist methodology for the evaluation of CBA. Um, key features of the design, so it was a realist evaluation, realist evaluation is one of the subset of theory based evaluations and that means that program theory is built into every step of the uh, evaluation design and uh, methods. It was a concurrent evaluation with results provided back to the intervention uh, annually for over a three and a half to four year period uh, with time series analysis of the results. It was a collaborative evaluation conducted by my extremely small private <laughs> company, i.e. two of us, uh, with all the data collected uh, by the fields, by field staff in the project and by the enumerators, but with us doing independent analysis and reporting. And that's to provide that uh, independent um, guarantee, if you like, in the analysis process. And it was also a capacity building evaluation. We went uh, over to the program. It was supposed to be annually. Uh, we ended up going over every six months for one week programs where we were working with the program to develop their capacity in realist approaches. So on the right hand side of this slide, you can see that we had, um, it was actually a very data rich evaluation, which we could only afford because the people who were implementing the program were collecting the data. But we had standards monitoring, so that's monitoring the health services against the government's own standards, um, citizen report card data, a household survey that looked at whether or not um, households did in fact develop 
better understanding and information about their rights and entitlements. And officials and cadres survey modified most significant change stories that were implemented in 24 of the 60 villages in the intervention. Set of nested cases looking at um, the villages which showed most middling and least change over the first year or two, um, and an awful lot of process monitoring data collected by uh, World Vision. Uh, I'm not going to talk about the outcomes, <laughs> frustrating as that might be. Um, there are two presentations up on the Global Platform for Social Accountability website um, about this evaluation, the World Bank um, uh, website. And so people who are interested the actual specifics of what did we find and how did we find it could look there. What I'm, uh, I am going to talk about is the change in the nature of program theory that we were able to produce by the end of this evaluation compared to what we had when we went in. So when we went in, we had um, a theory of action, who is supposed to do what and what is that supposed to lead to? And we had a theory of change that had eight main mechanisms in it. Um, and each of those mechanisms had been described and that theory was developed at a participatory workshop at the beginning of the evaluation. Um, <laughs> no, that's okay. Um, by the end of the evaluation, um, what we had was an abstracted middle level theory of change uh, for two things. Um, the first of these was about how is it that citizen voice and action actually changes power relationships. So down the bottom of this diagram, you see um, four things, four elements of the program intervention, um, which describes something about the nature of the intervention that then matters to how it works. So we've got the use of standards and scorecards. What matters about those? They provide criteria for judgments and they make those judgments transparent. What matters about having transparent judgments? Well, it facilitates, it facilitates discussion between and across stakeholder groups. Um, and it also informs leaders in health services and in local government and in district government about whether or not standards are actually being met. They often didn't know. Um, and so this was providing them with a whole lot of information that they could then use. Uh, the processes are structured, they're transparent and they're participatory. What matters about that? Well, it organises collective opinion. And it was health service managers and district level bureaucrats who told us that why that mattered was it because they could then say, this is not just us advocating on our own behalves. This is um, the voice of the people saying this is what is wrong. And it's much harder to dismiss that. And it's harder to dismiss than individual um, accountability, uh, individual opinion, sorry. Uh, what matters about the use of government standards? Well, it gives you a direct relationship to government policy. And what that does is legitimate claims and authorise action by people in the government system. Uh, it involves multiple stakeholder uh, authorities. What matters about that? It provides multiple kinds of authority and access to multiple kinds of resources in order to address problems. Now, as you can see that above those um, circles at the uh, second bottom row, there's a whole series of boxes about what is actually going on here. What is the change process that these things are triggering? And at the top level, we see that what actually, how this, this particular manifestation of a community accountability program worked was that it worked by triggering internal accountability systems within government and within health service providers. And as a result of those accountability, internal accountability systems being triggered and the use of all this other additional information, authorities did take action to address gaps and to improve standards. And there's evidence for that in the full report. So that was one of our sort of level abstracted theories. The second one um, dealt with, if we can get to the second one, was about how is it actually that CBA strengthens systems? And we heard reference this morning to system strengthening being an important area of work. This is a slightly more complicated diagram to talk through. So I'm not gonna go through every step of it, but to simply say that 
the bottom line again takes the bottom line in this diagram takes the situation at the beginning of the intervention. The second bottom line says what happens uh, in terms of uh, the translation, the change process. So citizens changed from being recipients of services to being sources of service useful information and claimants with rights. They were in fact brought inside the service delivery system and their experiences of success over the period of the project over four years contributed, it set up a feedback loop that contributed to them continuing to be involved. Uh, there was already information about what government uh, standards existed, but most, a lot of the people involved in implementation, like as in service providers and health service managers, didn't necessarily know what the standards were. Uh, what happened over the course of the project was not only did those people start to understand what the standards were, but many of them became disseminators of information about rights and standards. And that meant that information became get, got brought into play in decision making and so on and so forth. So I won't go through the rest of it in depth, um, but I do just want to finish off by saying what we think is useful about this particular approach is that by developing these middle range, middle level abstractions about how interventions <laughs> actually work, you can then pick those up and use them for the next round of research and evaluation work. Now, I'm pretty chuffed <laughs> uh, that these two particular diagrams have been picked up and they are being used now in the design of other evaluations. They've been picked up by the World Bank as well. Um, and what that means is that we can build on that now. We don't have to go on doing a single evaluation of a single project every time we do it. We can build uh, knowledge over time by working out how and where and why does it work like this? In what circumstances does it not work like this? What are the outcomes in those different circumstances? And so on. Probably gone over time, but thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Jim. Wonderful to hear. Uh, one observation, quick observation is that while the data using the realistic evaluation methodology, it, it produces huge data which may take 10 years for all of us to do the analysis. And, uh, do we the could go back and do and more. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so maybe we'll have the question and answer after all the three presentations. So may I now uh, invite uh, Indama Habib, who is a biostatistician by profession and working in the Department of Sexual and Reproductive Health, and is also the um, he's the lead statistician for the CAPSI project uh, at the WHO. So over to you. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, so. Okay, so yeah, so I'm going to talk about the interrupted time series design and analysis. And I'll also try to explain how we use this design to evaluate uh, the capsize study. Okay, so first I'm gonna talk about the key features of the interrupted time series design. It's a quasi-experimental design. And by that we mean there is no random allocation aspect of uh, intervention and control conditions to, to subjects. And it involves uh, collecting data at multiple points over time, at irregular time intervals before and after the introduction of the intervention. And so in essence is, is that it, com it compares the outcome data pattern at post intervention as compared to before intervention. But to use this design, you need to know exactly what time or the exact time at which you have uh, introduced your intervention. So in this slide, you will see a simple interrupted time series design with different scenarios of patterns of an outcome. 
And so you would see that, for example, um, you have observations, a total of six observations in the four panels. You see observation one to observation six. So you have observation one to observation three taken before the introduction of the intervention and observation four to six after the, the introduction of the intervention. So this is applicable for all the four scenarios here. And I think you would agree with me that there is an evidence of uh, impact of intervention when you look at scenario one and scenario four. Because in scenario one, you see that following the intervention introduction between observation three and four, there is an immediate shift in outcome to higher values. And the same applies to scenario four, but the only difference is that this is a temporal effect, meaning that after the introduction of the intervention, you have an effect, but it is very temporal. Now, I think you would also agree with me that really there is no evidence of impact of intervention when you look at scenario two and three. In scenario two, you have a steady increase in the outcome pattern, which is regardless of the introduction of the intervention. While in scenario four, scenario three, sorry, in scenario three, you have a series of, you know, increase and decrease in outcome over time, which is indicative of seasonal or cyclical trends. So these are the features that you can be able to see when you do the interrupted time series design. And this is the case of simple uh, interrupted time series involving just one group. And one thing that I should say as a strength of this design over a simple pretest post test uh, design, which involves just taking one observation before and one observation after, is that you may end up concluding that there is a treatment effect, intervention effect, for the case of scenario two and three. Okay, so that's the, the thing that I wanted to say here. Now, let's talk about the design strength. So this simple design, ITS design, is useful when you do not have a suitable control group. For example, you have one facility in the study. And it's also useful if you have access to regularly collected information, as long as you know the point at which you intervene with your intervention. And it can be used when contamination is a major concern, for example, when evaluating mass media or evaluation of national policies and legislations. And it can model the effect of time or time trends on the effectiveness of the intervention including accounting for lag in intervention effect during the statistical analysis. And the lag in intervention effect might arise when you have an intervention that takes time to come into full effect. So instead of having an intervention that whose impact you, you just uh, observe immediately, it takes time because maybe there is a, a time effect from the moment you roll out the intervention until the intervention ends. And also, uh, the, another good thing about this design is that it can detect and account for seasonal, secular, uh, temporal, or random fluctuation in trends and outcomes, for which you cannot find in the simple pretest postest design. This is what we saw in the previous slide. Okay, so now there is an improvement to the simple interrupted time series design, which is obtained by having a parallel control group design. So this design similar to the one we are talking about randomized control trials, but the only thing is that we do not randomize interventions here. Okay, so the investigator himself or herself chooses which facilities or clusters are going to be in the control group or in the parallel group. So it's an improvement 
because it controls for history bias. And the history bias occurs when you have a presence of core interventions that are occurring at the same time as you uh, study intervention. For example, if you can recall in the previous slide, uh, scenario one and, and four, where you see the intervention effect, but what if there was another co-intervention happening at the same time? So because you have one group, then it's not easy to see that. So among the strengths is that it allows for comparison, both between group outcome patterns, meaning that pre compared to post intervention patterns, as well as uh, within group as compared to between group patterns, between control and intervention. And it also allows for the assumption of uh, parallel trends to be, to be checked between control and intervention, which means that in the absence of introduction of the inter intervention, what would be the passage or what would be the trend for the control facilities as compared to the intervention facilities? Now let me talk about the capsize study, which you may, some of you might be familiar. So the primary objective of this study is to evaluate the effectiveness of social accountability intervention, capsize on the uptake of modern contraception in women in Ghana and Tanzania. And so we used uh, an ITS design with a control group. And so I'm going to talk about the intervention only to say that it took six months to roll out. Okay, so there is an intervention lag effect there. And also the intervention was delivered at community level while the outcome measurement was done at a facility level. And the treatment group received the usual standard of care uh, by national guidelines. Now I'm gonna show you uh, the graphs. So the first graph, First of all, I, I need to say that the primary outcome is the uptake in modern contraception, which was measured as the number of women requesting new use of modern contraception per 10,000 women of reproductive health. And in terms of statistical analysis, we are planning to apply the uh, two segment or three segmented uh, person regression model because this is a count and applying the general estimating equations, which take care of nature of measuring the outcomes for the same facility over time. And so I'm just going to talk about the first graph there. So this is a two segmented uh, regression which shows the impact of the intervention. The black line is the intervention where the red line is the control. So you can see, for example, the, uh, the, the, the level you know, you have the label at baseline for the for the control parameters, and also the level for the for the uh, intervention parameters as well. So you, it estimates the the level of uptake of contraception as well as the trend in uptake of of contraception, both at pre-intervention and post-intervention. So we expect if our design worked well then these parameters at pre-intervention will not be significant in the model. But we expect that if the intervention is effective, that the excess change in level post-intervention would be significant. So it could be either the change in, in the level at post-intervention related to the, uh, to the intervention up to the intervention, or it could be the excess trajectory related to use of, of that introduction to the intervention could be significant. So for the, uh, because of time, I'm not going to talk uh, about the second one, but the second one simply includes the, uh, the uh, intervention, uh, intervention uh, rollout period as well. <laughs> so because of time, I will not talk about it. Thank you. Thank you. That's wonderful to hear the um, interrupted time series design and the analysis plan as part of the website project. Um, really looking forward to the results in terms of how it looks. Um, the, the third presentation, we have a 
uh, speaker who is joining us remotely and uh, name is Kenneth Sher is a professor in the Department of Global Health at the University of Washington. Uh, and Dr. Sher's research focuses on developing and testing practical solutions to support data-driven decision-making. Uh, Dr. Sher has led large-scale implementation research projects, including even at the university uh, training curricula, including the development of the world's first PhD program in implementation science. So over to you, Kenneth. Could, could you hear us? Hello. Yeah, I think you're unmuted. Please go ahead. The rest of the participants, please bear with us. We are checking the challenges in the technology for this presentation. Dr. Sher, can you hear me? This is Niranjan Sagoti. Please unmute Mike if it is muted. Sorry about that. So, problem with that computer guy, right? We checked it earlier. It was working fine. It was working fine. Yeah. Dr. Sher should rejoin. While we are sorting out uh, this issue with the technology, uh, can I uh, invite to ask uh, questions to the previous presentations? Anyone has questions? Yeah. You mentioned that the data in the facility level and the actions at the community level. And I was wondering what level of saturation is the intervention having on the health facility? Can you hear me now? Oh, just kidding. Ready? No, it sounds like you can hear me. Do you want to answer that question first? Here, um, you want to answer the question? Yeah. Um, the level of situation, what do you need coverage? Yeah, yeah, the coverage. What percentage of the health facility to have that coverage? Yeah, I think uh, that question may be maybe able to answer, but the idea is that the catchment area was uh, selected based on the, the data or information that was given by the ministries, which is in Ghana and Tanzania. And so the coverage is supposed to approach, I mean, 100%, but of course we know we can't get 100% coverage. Yeah, but of course I understand that would have an impact also on the, on the evaluation of the outcomes here. Um, maybe let's have uh, Dr. Sher present uh, the um, this on implementation science and social accountability programs. Dr. Sher, over to you. Okay, thank you, everybody, and um, 
I apologize, I'm not able to be there in person. Uh, I read with great interest the Boydell article, uh, which uh, was you were kind enough to share with me. And I think there's quite a lot of overlap between how the world of implementation science is is speaking, as well as those uh, with, from your domains, and particularly around complex, multi-component, and adaptive implementation strategies, as well as the importance of, of context. And I do think that implementation science uh, really may be applicable for unpacking a lot of the heterogeneity of, of effects seen across context for social accountability programs, understanding barriers and facilitators for implementation, and then thinking about transferability to novel settings. And I, I also think that implementation science goes really nicely with the, the previous two speakers on both time series analysis, as well as realist evaluations, as it provides a, a set of tools that can help in both practice as well as implementation research projects. So, uh, in the in the pathway from intervention development through improving health outcomes, we ask a, a series of, of different questions along this translational highway, from discovery through to development and delivery, and then improved health outcomes. So, at the level of discovery, and could you go to the next uh, hit advance, please? Do it three more times. you then we're really asking oh go back up we're really asking questions at the discovery level around defining those mechanisms and targets for new intervention and in, interventions or diagnosis platforms and treatment and prevention methods and then they get developed into in those new biomedical interventions and tested in highly controlled environments these are the the phase three uh, efficacy trials or we take intervention from the laboratory and bring it to the bedside but implementation science really comes in and understanding and exploring how to deliver evidence-based interventions in real world settings, that third step of translation, which I've depicted as a, a black box of delivery because delivery systems, uh, whether it's in a health system or outside of a formal health system are highly complex with uh, unclear levers for change. Um, and it's also been depicted as black holes because they can take a lot of resources and then ultimately leading to improved health outcomes where we're studying influences of, of interventions on the health of populations. And for implementation science, I, I put it both in this area of T3 and T4, where we want to understand delivery approaches that lead to uh, improved health outcomes and hopefully at a scaled level uh, so that we can establish population level benefits of interventions. The next slide, please. So the, just a bit on terminology, and, and I appreciated this from the Boydell article, that there's a difference between an evidence-based intervention and implementation strategies. So uh, just for the purposes of this talk, evidence interventions I use as those programs, practices, principles, procedures, products, pills, and policies that improve health behaviors, health outcomes, or health-related environments. And this is the what. So at the core of health services are delivered a series of prevention and treatment activities, uh, and, and I'm distinguishing that from implementation strategies, which are those actions to enhance the adoption, implementation, and sustainability of evidence-based interventions. That's the how. So thinking in this framework, I would put uh, the I would put the social accountability programs as an implementation strategy, really figuring out how to best uh, lead, to, lead to improved uptake and, and sustained use of evidence-based interventions. Um, through complex processes, as we heard uh, in the realist evaluation talk. Next slide, please. So there's, uh, just thinking about the value chain or the pathway from an intervention strategy or those evidence-based practices or evidence-based interventions leading to uh, some level client outcomes. Traditionally, there's been a focus on understanding that link from whether or not an intervention uh, is when it's put in place into it in a controlled environment, whether it leads to cl client outcomes. Get the next slide, please. And this has been really the what has driven a lot of of health research over uh, historically. Um, next, please. Well, implementation science has been focusing on the development of implementation strategies 
It could be at a systems or environmental level, organizational level, uh, group or, or provider level. It can include things like supervision or mentorship or uh, strategies <clears throat> that address needs and barriers at an individual provider or consumer level to see whether it leads to improved implementation of those evidence-based interventions. And that's, that would include domains like feasibility, uh, fidelity to intervention, or fidelity really speaking to the core components of an, of an intervention being delivered as intended, a penetration within an organizational setting. So how deeply does an intervention enter into the, into the organization so it could be routinely applied, acceptability by stakeholders, uh, sustainability in organizational context, um, uptake or adoption within those organizations, and ultimately costs. Uh, if, uh, if in this theory change, things work as intended, uh, implementation strategies lead to improved implementation outcomes, which improve, improve service outcomes, which they have more efficient, safe, effective, equitable, patient-centered, and timely delivery of evidence-based interventions, and then that will lead to improved patient-level outcomes, satisfaction, function, and symptomology. Uh, next slide, please. So this has been the core of implementation research, really testing, developing and testing implementation strategies to see whether they lead to those improved implementation outcomes and potentially service outcomes. Although I would argue that it, for an implementation science to be, uh, to maximize impact, we really need to be thinking across that whole value change, including the dynamics or dimensions of the intervention itself and, and trying to study outcomes at, down to a client or patient level. Although we tend to really focus in on implementation strategies and their impact uh, at the level of implementation of evidence-based interventions. Next please, slide please. A hallmark of implementation science are the use of theories, models, and frameworks. And there's a really nice article uh, that was published in Implementation Science in 2015 that tried to tame this, this vast area of theories, models, and frameworks. Uh, there was a previous article that reviewed over 60 uh, theories, models, and frameworks in the field of implementation science. Uh, and so it's really quite a, a large domain or, or body of, of work that is going on. Uh, but what this article did was categorize theories, models, and frameworks into uh, three areas of intent, uh, one being that the use of theories, models, and frameworks to describe or guide the process of translating research into practice. And these are action models that are really designed to provide practical guidance as you're planning and executing an implementation strategy to support implementation. And this includes models like the PRISM or Practical Robust Implementation Sustainability Model, the EPIS model, Exploration, Penetration, Implementation, Sustainment Model, or Dynamic Sustainability Framework. Then the second area are, are a series of frameworks or theories for understanding or explaining what influences implementation outcomes. This includes determinant frameworks, which are aimed to understand or explain influences on implementation outcomes. Uh, those, these are the, designed to specify the types and domains of determinants that are, are barriers or enablers or independent variables that influence those implementation outcomes, those dependent variables. And here, there's a couple well-known frameworks, one being the Consolidated Framework for Implementation Research, or the CIFR, another being the Theoretical Domains Framework. Also within understanding or explaining what influences implementation outcomes, we have classic theory. These are classic theories like diffusion of innovation or uh, the theory of planned behavior, largely coming from uh, fields in the social sciences or organizational theory that can uh, be applied to understand implementation. And then implementation theories, those are those theories that have been developed by implementation researchers to provide understanding or explanation of aspects of implementation. Uh, and then finally, evaluation frameworks, which are, are really guiding the summative evaluation like the REAIM framework. I'm getting a time out, so I'm gonna hustle through to the end of this talk. Can we go to the next slide, please? You know, it, and this is a slide of just looking at implementation across of antiretroviral therapy or TB screening within patients who are HIV infected in Mozambique and 32 health facilities. And it depicts a common picture we see with implementation as well as implementation research, where you see tremendous heterogeneity across implementation units, in this case, health facilities. Next slide, please. It brings us to what Don Berwick has been quoted as saying, every person, 
process is perfectly designed to give you the exactly the outcome that you get. And in this case, it's not a question of resources. It's a question of organizational culture and ways of doing business. And really the application of implementation science theories, models, and frameworks can, can be used to help understand this heterogeneity and why we're seeing such different uh, effects across contexts. In the case, uh, if we go to the next slide, in the case of the Consolidated Framework for Implementation Research, which is a, a meta-theoretical framework really derived from multiple frameworks in the field, what we have done is used the, the heterogeneity of effects looking at uh, how different organizational units are performing as a sampling strategy to then through mostly a qualitative endeavor go in and explore across these domains of intervention characteristics, the culture of the inner setting, the outer setting, individuals involved from both a provider and potentially patient perspective or client perspective, and the implementation process to, to understand what are those core components of, of an implementation strategy and how uh, the implementation process has really driven the, the success or failures that are observed and really under trying to understand then what are those barriers of facilitators. You can skip across two slides. For sure. Yeah, I'll go one more. I'm just going to summarize one more slide. Okay, sure. Go ahead. Can you go go advance one more, please? I'll just keep going to all the way to the next slide. One more to the last slide. Yeah. So the, you know, in this case, the, the formal implementation science methods can can help inform research on potential social disabilities. Go ahead. By unpacking that heterogeneity in both research context as well as practice context. And exploiting that context not as an effect modifier, not as a nuisance variable. So not something you want to control for in a quantitative analysis, but really exploring how context is really impacting the uh, the effects that we're observing. And ultimately, to what we endeavor to do is identify those core components and those barriers of facilitators in, in order to not uh, in, in ensure generalizability of findings, because I think that is a, a tall task in the work that we do, but to enhance the transferability to new settings. Can identify what are those core components and the barriers and facilitators for implementation, then we can think about how, as we go to novel settings, we can better implement the social accountability programs. The one question I have, I think that's worthy of discussion, is understanding what are those systems for implementing and scaling up social accountability programs and their mechanisms for impact, because it's going to be really measuring the at the level of, of the organizational setting a lot of our, our findings or, or, or a lot of the barriers of facilitators for implementation and uh, it may be outside of the health system where these organizational settings are being situated. So thank you very much. Apologies for going over time. Yeah, thanks so much, Dr. Uh, people on the line, uh, you may please type your questions in the chat box and uh, uh, we'll uh, ask the presenters the uh, same questions. And um, do we have about five minutes time to five minutes? Quick. I know, yeah, we are stepping into the other session, but maybe just five minutes for a quick three questions. Thank you for the presentation. And my question goes to you. Uh, most of the uh, social accountability intervention work done by the CEOs and the CSOs are not research design and uh, mostly depend on human systems to measure the uh, outcomes or effectiveness in the lab. So my question is, are there limits, uh, limitations for these uh, implementers who are doing um, social accountability intervention without uh, research? Are there limitations to do with um, there is there is something to take into account. I wouldn't say it's necessarily an implementation, but a realist evaluation needs probably more data that is already being collected um, because it needs data about the change, the underlying mechanisms, and what is it in the context that is affecting whether or not those mechanisms operate, um, and because it's the underlying mechanisms that cause the outcome. Uh, in a realistic approach. 
So you need to put in a little bit more time up front to develop a theory of change, which is a realist theory of change, and why do we believe this works? What is it in the context that we think is going to affect that? And then you design your data collection so that you've got data about implementation for, for process evaluation or for implementation science style evaluation, plus data about context, mechanism, and outcome. But there's no reason why community-based organisations or community-based organisations with a bit of help from an evaluator can't do it. I spent the first 10 years of my career as a realist evaluator doing small-scale community-based realist evaluations, um, and it can be done. Any other questions from the floor? would support better evaluation um, but I also agree it doesn't substitute for uh, high quality evaluation you need both so uh, this is our last question from the room but if there are any other online questions we can take it but I wanted to pick up on that question about poor program documentation <coughs> ask this question where in much more of my um, I'm working a lot with WHO archives, materials, sources, foundations, and I have to say that a real issue that people in the future are going to have or are already having is they want to understand these decision making processes in terms of input. There are no longer the same type of transparent sources of information. So I can go back to projects from the 60s and 70s and literally make correspondence between key actors. And that we never have access to today, which leads one to you know, think, well, we don't really have transparency and accountability anymore. The way that documentation is both stored, shared, mobilized, which makes it very difficult to unpick these patterns uh, kind of after the fact, and both unpicking them in the current form, but also much later when we have that. But then additionally, we can really destroy the understanding of um, this. I, it's just like, I don't know, it's a huge <laughs> it's a huge can I just add to that very quickly? I think when we think about accountability, we need to be thinking about accountability of whom, to whom, for what. And that includes the accountability of donors. And it includes, and who is holding the donors accountable for what. It includes um, accountability. It includes downwards accountability by the big uh, international NGOs, for example. And there's been a little bit of work on that. It includes accountability of organisations like World Bank and World Health Organisation for what you require um, of the people that you in terms of documentation. 
uh, and accountability for learning, not just accountability for comes on seats. We do that. So I, I think actually expanding this conversation about what do we mean by accountability in order for us to be able to improve outcomes, which is what we're all about, uh, would be a fine thing. Thanks so much. Uh, uh, let's give a big round of applause to you. And, uh, I'm not going to uh, summarize the whole discussion, but just wanted to say one thing, and that is the, the, as the social accountability interventions are so complex, the measurement of accountability interventions are going to be much more complex. And the measurement and the study designs have to evolve and then evolving quite promising to see the way that we can actually measure and think about the outcome rather than what we otherwise anticipate to achieve thank you so much